All right, well, we've already read our text, so we're just going to go ahead and jump into it, beginning with a bit of review from uh, what it is that we um, saw last, um, last Lord's Day. Last week, as I've already mentioned, we saw the um, Jesus battling with our enemy. Remember, as the second Adam, he had to go out and defeat the one who essentially had destroyed us all when he tempted the first Adam and overcame him that he might save us. That is, the second Adam had to defeat him in order that he might save us. Now, we saw how Jesus did this again as well. Uh, He was able to see through the devil's lies because he knew God's word. He knew the truth. And because he also stuck to the path. He was willing, of course, to live according to that truth because being filled with the Holy Spirit, that is what he wanted to do. Now, again, I think we've already seen many examples of this, even this morning. But we do need to remember that the devil is real, okay? And his demons are still real, and they are still very active in this world, and they still want to destroy us. And the way they do it is mainly through deception. The only way that we can overcome them is we need to recognize that deception by knowing the truth. And, of course, we want to, uh, we have to also want to follow the truth, And we're only going to be able to do that if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to trust Him, be filled with the Spirit, know His truth, and follow His truth. We have to really, again, judge all things by the Word of God. Now, we saw, secondly, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We saw His popularity in the the region of Galilee and actually throughout His ministry. That was the area where people tended to follow Him more. It was basically Judea that was having the difficulty, particularly in Jerusalem. But that wasn't the only place. Remember, we saw the difficulty that Jesus had to face when he was in Nazareth, how when he was asked to read and the portion of Scripture was given to him from Isaiah the prophet and it had to do with the Messiah, and he said essentially he was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy regarding the Messiah, how the people became a mob, dragged him out of the city and tried to throw him off a cliff wasn't exactly popular in that town, but remember how Jesus miraculously walked through the middle of the crowd and went on his way because it wasn't his time. Now, again, this reminds us that if we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then, you know, if we're willing to stand out like Jesus stood out, if we're willing to identify ourselves with Jesus, if we're willing to fight his battles and and basically stand for his truth, we're not going to be popular. We're also going to be hated But we're also going to be protected like our Lord Jesus Christ was protected because Jesus promised that he would and that he would be with us to help us even to the end. Nothing can really happen to us outside of God's will. If it isn't our time, no one can take away our lives. Our times are entirely in the Lord's hands. But this morning we see Jesus now return to Capernaum to continue his ministry there. And what I want us to look at from this passage this morning is really a couple of different things. First of all, I want us to see the demonstration of Jesus' authority. And again, we've already seen it. We're going to see more of it as we go through this book. But also, I want us to see how his audience responded to this authority. I mean, Jesus was the best act going in town. They were really amazed at him and marveling, followed him for a time. But we'll see that that quickly fell off. Now, first of all, we see Jesus demonstrate his authority, and we see him do that in three different areas. We see it in his teaching, we see his authority over the demons, and we see his authority over sickness. Now, first of all, we see his authority in his teaching, Jesus taught with authority. Luke tells us that he came to Capernaum. Now, Nazareth and Capernaum are both in Galilee. Nazareth is basically a little bit south and west of Capernaum, and if you're heading, excuse me, of of the Sea of Galilee, and if you're going to Capernaum, it's basically on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Capernaum is the place that Jesus was going to make his headquarters throughout most of his ministry, particularly when he's ministering in Galilee. And by the way, we'll see, um, well, actually we see in our text this morning, uh, the place where he stays is um, Peter's house. Okay, that's, that's where Jesus lived. 
Yes, the disciples, actually some of them did have places uh, to live and houses that they had to maintain. Now, as was his custom, Jesus again went into the synagogue on the Sabbath in order to worship and honor his Father. And again, let me just simply point this out, that Jesus kept the law of God. He kept all the law of God. And he kept it to save us. He had to fulfill righteousness for us. We, we couldn't keep it. Uh, we had already broken it in Adam. We break it every single day since we've come into this world. But Jesus kept it for us in order that he might give us a perfect righteousness. But let's remember that he didn't do it just for that reason. He didn't do it merely out of a sense of duty. He obeyed the law of God because that is what he actually wanted to do, because it was the delight of his heart. Uh, John actually reminds us in 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse 3, that the commandments of God really are not a burden. Uh, they're not a burden to us because the Spirit of God gives to us a love for those things. We see that they're right. We see that they're good. And that's really the way we want to go. And it's not a burden to do something that you really want to do. It only becomes a burden when you don't want to do it. So this is one of the ways we can kind of, um, you know, uh, check our hearts. Do we find it a burden to do what the Lord calls us to do? Well, the problem is... We're not loving Jesus the way we should. We don't have that, that fullness of the Holy Spirit who gives us that love. Otherwise, it would be our delight to do these things. Well, again, Jesus, as I mentioned, was asked to read. And afterward, like he did before, he began to teach. Now, this time, Luke, instead of drawing our attention to what Jesus read and what he had to say about it, which is what we saw last time, he read about the Messiah, <coughs> excuse me, and he said he was the fulfillment, and that's kind of what got them riled up. This time, Luke draws our attention to the way in which Jesus taught. He taught with authority, so much so that those who heard him were amazed. Now, the word here, amazed, means astounded. They were overwhelmed not only by the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, remember at a mere age of 12, when most of us are, are just coming into our preteens and uh, usually really struggling with uh, the way we behave, right? Jesus was in the temple talking to the teachers of Israel, asking them questions and answering their questions, and they were amazed at his understanding. Well, now Jesus is fully grown. He's begun his ministry. He knows the Word of God quite well. They were amazed, certainly, at uh, his wisdom, at his ability to speak the word of God and to make it clear and with the authority with which he actually delivered this message. You know, that's something we see as a recurring theme throughout the Gospels. When Jesus finished his Sermon on the Mount, we read in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as they're scribes. Now, again, we see the same thing here. They're amazed at the authority. Why is that? It's because of the way that the Word of God was usually brought to them. Now, when we see him contrasted with the scribes, the scribes were essentially the lawyers of Israel. They were the ones whose job it was to copy the Scriptures, and they did that day after day, copying the manuscripts. And, you know, if you copy a book enough times, after a while, you begin to understand a little bit about what that book says. And you begin to become one of those who knows more about that book than other people. And so then you are elevated as a teacher. But the thing is, these scribes were lacking in a few areas. They didn't know the scriptures as Jesus knew them. They only saw what was on the surface. Jesus knew the true meaning behind them. Jesus actually is the meaning behind these scriptures. Jesus is the logos, John tells us. He is the one who is... God's communication to us. He is the one who has come down to explain God to us, not only by what he says, but by the way he lives. He is the expert. And not only, of course, um, could he teach it better than them, but he could also do it with a clarity and a love and conviction that they did not have. Essentially, this was the best they had ever heard. He was better than Spurgeon. He was better than Jonathan Edwards, although he wasn't necessarily even touted as the greatest 
um, preacher, but he was better than George Whitfield. Jesus was the greatest preacher who ever lived, and it's because he is essentially the living Word of God. He could speak the Word with authority because he knew exactly what it meant, and he had the passion to preach it with that, um, well, with that conviction and authority. Now, secondly, we see Jesus demonstrated his authority over the demons, which, of course, shouldn't surprise us because he's already gone after their captain, and he defeated him. Uh, I don't think Luke records this, but after the last temptation, Jesus told him, Be gone, Satan. And Satan left because Jesus has authority. Well, we see that authority exercised now over the, uh, the army of the devil. There was a man in the synagogue who was possessed by a demon, which essentially means this demon had control over the man. Now, normally... Uh, our soul or our spirit, remember that um, God has made us to be material and immaterial. We have a body and we have a soul, and the word soul and spirit essentially in the Bible are synonymous. We're not three different things. We're two different things, immaterial and material. Well, our soul, the immaterial part of us, that part where our personality resides, that part that's going to go to heaven when we die if we're trusting in Jesus, Normally, the soul is what controls our body, and it does it through our brain. We believe that our brain is made in such a way that our spirits can control our bodies through our brain. It's the place where the immaterial and the material actually interact with one another, and we can make our bodies do what we want them to do. Now, in this case, there was another spirit, a demon, that was residing in this individual that was controlling his body instead of him. Now, this man must not have been a believer because otherwise this demon would never have been able to possess him and control him in the way this demon was controlling this man. By the way, uh, there is some question, I think, in Christian circles whether or not demon possession is still possible today. I tend to think that it, that it is, but no Christian will ever be able to be possessed by the enemy because we are possessed by a greater spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit. Well, this man was possessed by an unclean spirit, and when he saw Jesus, he cried out in verse 34, Let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. Now again, notice a few things here about the demon's relationship with Jesus. First of all, the demon immediately recognized Jesus. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now the other demons apparently knew that as well as we see in verse 41. They all, when they saw him, shouted out, you are the Son of God. So first of all, they know who Jesus is that he is no, no mere man. They knew he was the Christ. They knew he was the Son of God or the eternal second person of the Godhead. Secondly, we see the demon was afraid of Jesus. Have you come to destroy us? Now, the demons know what's going to happen to them. They know that um, on the day of judgment, that when it comes, that he and his other demons are going to be thrown into the lake of fire by this one that was standing right in front of them, along with everyone else on that day who hasn't turned from their sins and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the demon, when he saw Jesus, was wondering, has that day already come? Well, we know it hasn't, but it is coming. And then thirdly, he recognized Jesus' authority. When Jesus told the demon to basically be quiet and come out of him, he immediately obeyed him. And the same thing is true in verse 41 where we read this. Demons also were coming out of many shouting, you are the son of God. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak because they knew him to be the Christ. Now, Jesus was being a little bit evasive about whether or not he was the Christ, whether he was the Messiah, because there were people who would want to kill him for that reason. And his time had not yet come when he would be given over to his enemies 
in order to be crucified. So he wanted to keep his identity a secret so that he could complete his mission. And so that's why he rebuked them, why he told them to be quiet, not to mention the fact that the last, uh, the last evangelist that Jesus wanted was a demon-possessed man, okay, coming after him and shouting who he is. The same thing happened to, remember, Paul and Silas when they were in Philippi, how the demon-possessed girl was following him, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who are declaring to you the way of salvation. And Paul turned and rebuked her and said, come out of her, you unclean spirit. Why didn't he just say, keep it up, you know, that... We want more of this kind of promotion. Well, that, that's not what we want. You know, evil things, evil beings declaring what it is we're doing, okay? Jesus rebukes and casts the demon out of this person. And when those in the synagogue saw the authority that he had, even over the demons, they were again amazed. And we read in verse 36, what is this message? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out of him. And word about him kept spreading. And then thirdly, we see Jesus demonstrating his authority over sickness. After he left the synagogue, he entered into Simon's house, where he was staying in Capernaum. And when he entered, he found Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And Simon and his wife asking Jesus for help. Now, I think you know that this particular Simon is Simon Peter, and uh, Luke uses the name Simon perhaps a bit more, but he certainly does use the name Peter as well. We read in a parallel passage in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 14, when Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. Now, I don't know, uh, sometimes I think, as we read the Gospels, we get the impression that none of the disciples were actually married. I remember um, reading this passage and seeing the fact that Peter had a mother-in-law. I was thinking, well, if he had a mother-in-law, he must be a married man, right? So we're, we're told here that Peter was certainly married. And Paul seems to indicate that all the apostles were actually married. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5, listen to what he says here. Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? So the apostles, the Lord's brothers, who were, as you know, later converted to Christianity, and Cephas, who was also Simon, who was also Peter, they're also married. Now, it may be that, that their wives are not mentioned because of the times and because of the work that the Lord had called them to do, because they often had to leave their, their wives and their homes and follow the Lord. They were, after all, laying the foundation of the Christian church that was going to last throughout the ages to the very end. Uh, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 28. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none. Now, I don't think that means that uh, the apostles were concerned about their wives and their children and their households. I think they still had to maintain those things according to the, to the Word of God. But they often had to leave things that were nearest and dearest to them, those who were nearest and dearest, in order to do the work that the Lord had called them to do. Remember what our Lord tells us, that our love for those closest to us has to be a distant second to our love for Him. And here we see that in the lives of these apostles. But again, so Jesus comes into Simon's house and Simon's mother-in-law is ill and we see uh, basically Simon and his wife coming to Jesus asking that he might heal her. And it's here that we see Jesus' authority over sickness. We read in verse 39. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she immediately got up and waited on them. By the way, as just a side note, what is our response to the Lord's mercies to us? Do we just get up and kind of go and do our own thing, get up and go, go play, get up and, and go do other things that, that maybe we would enjoy doing? Well, she did get up and do something she enjoyed doing, and that was waiting on them. She served them, and that's what the Lord calls us to do. And Luke also writes in verse 40, while the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him 
and laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. And so we see that Jesus commands disease, and even the disease obeys him. Now Luke is painting a picture for us here. There is a certain pattern that is emerging. Jesus has authority over the devil. Jesus has authority over his own life. No one can take it from him unless he gives it over to them, and that's what we see later in the gospel. Jesus has authority over the demons. Jesus has authority over sickness. We read in our meditation this morning, and we're going to see this shortly in Luke's gospel, Jesus is going to command the wind and the waves, and they obey him. Uh, this evening, we're going to look at uh, how he commands the fish and tells them to swim into the net so that the nets become full. Jesus has authority on earth over everything. There's really only one thing that Jesus did not yet have authority over as the God-man, and that was authority over the kingdoms of the earth. Okay, Remember, that's what the devil tried to tempt him with. I'll, he showed them all to him. I'll give these to you if you will bow down and worship me. Well, he knew that that's why Jesus came into the world, and that is what Jesus would be given at the culmination of his ministry when he ascends into heaven, he sits at the right hand of God and he is crowned as ruler and king over all things. To rule and over, overrule all things for the good of his people, us, and his kingdom. <clears throat> and by the way, that's what I, why I said that we can have confidence. Jesus is the one who's in control. Jesus has authority. The only reason why things are happening the way they're happening right now is because that is what the Lord wills. And why does he will that to take place? It's so that we will seek him. You know, trials strengthen us because they force us to seek after the Lord. But let's gain some confidence here in the fact that nothing's going to happen to us outside of the will of God. Now, finally, we see the people's response, that they were attracted to this authority. Man, this is the best show going. You know, this is the... The new series that everybody has to watch on TV, right? It's Jesus is here. How exciting. He's doing things we've never seen before. And that's essentially what this all amounts to, okay? Now, look at, first of all, their excitement. On the next day, Jesus left the city to be alone. The first thing they did was they went out to find him because they liked him so much. He's so exciting. Now, Jesus likely went out to refresh himself in prayer before he continued his ministry, but they wanted him to stay, and when they found him, they begged him to stay, but he refused. Why? Not because he didn't care about them, but because he needed to preach the gospel in other places. That's the reason why Jesus came. That's the reason why he was sent into the world, was to preach the gospel, and they had already heard it, so it was time to go somewhere else. By the way, uh, the point here is this, that in a very short time, Jesus is going to point to Capernaum as an example of a city that is going to undergo a greater judgment on the day of judgment than Sodom and Gomorrah, essentially. He says this in Luke 10, verse 15, and you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades, essentially you're going to go to the grave, okay? There's going to be judgment. On another occasion, he says it's going to be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon and for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for Capernaum, what, this group of people that were excited and were out looking for him? Well, it's because they were only following him because it was, again, novel. It was exciting. It was something that was new. They didn't really love him. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to follow Jesus during the time of his popularity, and they're going to be heralding him everywhere he goes when he enters into Jerusalem. How many people are there that are going to be throwing palm leaves in front of him and hailing him, you know, Hosanna, bless, you know, save now, uh, son of David, anointed one, king of Israel, and they're, they're worshiping him, but by the end of that week, they're all crying out for his crucifixion. The reason why that happens is because they're enamored by his popularity, but they don't really love him. They didn't really love him because if they did, they would never have turned away from him. 
So his authority was attractive, but it wasn't enough. Okay? There needs to be something more. There needs to be the work of the Holy Spirit to change the heart. So what is it we can learn from these things we've just seen? Well, first of all, I want you to notice who Jesus is. I mean, there's a reason why he did these things. There's a reason why his authority was on display, and it was meant to show us one thing, that he is, in fact, the Christ, the Son of God. He didn't want people heralding it. He wasn't going to say it, but rather he was going to demonstrate it. Remember? When we, we looked ahead and we saw the messengers of John the Baptist coming to Jesus saying, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? Are you the Messiah? Jesus didn't say, I'm the Messiah. Go back and tell him I'm the Messiah. He said, go tell John the things that you see and the things that you hear. And then he begins to list out all the things he was doing, all the healings, and he was doing basically everything Messiah was going to do, his preaching and his healing ministry that proved that he was the Messiah. So all these things are meant to show us that he is the Son of God, that he is the one the Father sent into the world to be the king of the world. He is the one who, you know, from, from our perspective, is ruling the world and the one to whom the whole world one day is going to give an account. By the way, that, um, that, that's kind of a scary thing, isn't it? I mean, the Bible does say that one day we're going to have to stand before Jesus and he is going to have the honor of basically judging all mankind. And there's only going to be two groups of people there, those that have trusted in him that are on his right-hand side who are the sheep and those who have not who are the goats. The sheep are going to be welcomed into his kingdom because they loved him, trusted him, they followed him, they showed that they did by doing his works. And the sheep, or the goats, excuse me, the goats are going to be cast into the lake of fire because they showed by their lives they really didn't love him. They were the ones doing the evil things. Remember what Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? It's not enough to call him Lord. We actually need to submit. Remember, we are going to give an account of our lives to Jesus on that day. Now, secondly, and this follows from that, because he is the king, because he is our king, because he is the one who has been given all this authority, we do need to listen to what he has to say. We do need to follow him. We do need to obey him. Now, the good news is that's not a hard thing to do, right? I mean, it can be hard some of the situations, but it shouldn't be such a struggle in our hearts because he has given us the ability to obey Him. If we have turned from our sins and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have only done it because we have the Spirit of God. And if we have the Spirit of God, we have the love that we need for the commandments that turn the commandments from a burden into a delight. The commandments should not be a burden to us if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, we'd have to admit sometimes they are a burden. Sometimes they are difficult. Maybe a lot of the time they're difficult. Uh, which of us can say that we keep them perfectly? Which of us can say that we delight in them like Jesus does and love them the way he does and that we are doing them the way Jesus did? Which of us can say that we love the Father the way that Jesus did, as strongly as Jesus did? With all of our hearts and mind and soul and strength, loving him with our, our whole life, with all of our time and our talents, with all of our energies and gifts, with everything that we have. You see, that's the way Jesus loved the Father, and that's the way that he calls us to love him. And that's really what the commandments are actually all about. You know, which of us can say that we love him in that way? Now, we might love him, but to that degree. Well, what can we do about it? How can we love him more? One thing we need to remember is that when the Lord comes into our lives and He gives us His Holy Spirit, He doesn't give to us everything He intends to give to us at that moment. And we can even lose some of the influence that, that He has given to us by the Spirit, but we will never lose Him entirely. We'll never lose that desire for Him. But again, it can rise and fall. So how can we have more of that influence? How can we love the Lord more? Well, first of all, I think we need to 
commit our lives to the Lord or in our case, recommit our lives to the Lord to being what it is that Jesus actually calls us to be. We need to set aside, in other words, the things that are actually getting in our way, the things that are drawing us away from Him. Remember what uh, Susanna Wesley said to her children, the, the, I think the 10 or 11 that survived out of the, um, the 20 plus children that she actually gave birth to. She taught them to know the difference between what's good and what's bad, what's sin and what isn't sin. And the difference is whatever basically takes away your love for the Lord, that's sin. For you, that's sin. Don't do it. That is going to weaken you. But whatever, of course, draws you closer to the Lord, that's what's good. That's what you need to do. Now, what we need to do is we need to get away from the things that are sucking the life out of us and quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit. Those things are sin for us, even if they aren't necessarily sinful in and of themselves. If they take away our love for the Lord, then they are sin, they are bad, and we need to get away from them. And we need to immerse ourselves in the things that draw us near to the Lord. The same things that Jesus used. Remember, Jesus, he wasn't just automatically walking around with all this power, but he did certain things to draw near to his Father. One of those things was meeting with God's people on the Sabbath in the synagogue, just as we today meet with the people of God on the first day of the week, the Christian Sabbath, in order to worship the Lord, in order to fellowship with God's people. We need to spend time in the Word of God and prayer it makes a big difference. If we immerse ourselves into an imaginary world or into a worldly world through media, we can have our affections going out that direction, and, and they shouldn't be because that's what weakens us. But if we read the Word of God and we get immersed in this world, which is really the truth, it draws our affections in this direction, and we begin going in the right direction. So we need to spend time in worship. We need to spend time in the Word, we need to spend time in prayer, we need to spend time with each other in fellowship because we need each other and that encouragement and the gifts that the Lord has given to each other. And we also need to serve one another, just like Peter's mother-in-law, when she was healed, got up and served. That's the right response, but it also tends to strengthen us in the Lord. So the bottom line is if we keep feeding our flesh, uh, we're, and not our souls, we're going to find ourselves struggling to obey. But if we feed our souls, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to grow in our obedience because our love is going to become stronger. Now, one last point, and this is just simply to open up what we're going to look at this evening. We do need to realize that because Jesus is the King to whom everyone will one day give an account we also need to do what we can to help others find Him before that day comes by sharing the gospel with others, knowing that He is going to help us. Now, essentially, that's a summary of what we're going to look at this evening when Jesus does the miracle of filling the nets with fish and He calls uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John to be His first disciples and says, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. The Lord calls us also to follow Him, and He will make us to be fishers of men. Now, that's what we're going to look at this evening, but we do need to realize that that is what the Lord, who has authority, actually calls us to do. And the purpose behind it is not just to put a notch on our Bibles, but it is to help our neighbor get ready for the day of judgment when they're going to have to stand before the Lord and give an account of their lives. There's going to be people there that we know, maybe people that we knew for a long time but never shared the gospel with. We're going to be partly responsible for their being there. And there's going to be people on our side, on the, on the right side, that we know that maybe we are instrumental in bringing to faith in Christ. We're a part of that, of that process, and that's what this is all about, being fishers of men, reaching out to others to help them get ready to turn from their sins and to trust in the Lord and to follow Him because that is the only way they're going to be safe on that final day. Now again, how do we know that's true? 
because that's what the Lord tells us and that's what the table of the Lord reminds us of this morning. If there was no th judgment that was threatening us, Jesus would not have needed to go to the cross. God did not torture his son. He didn't pour his wrath out on his son for nothing. He did it so that we might be saved from a very real danger that those who are out there are still in danger of. So we need to think about that as we prepare to come to the table. So let's bow, shall we, uh, for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us to apply what we've heard as we prepare to come to remember the Lord at his table.